Hello and welcome to the Open Ground Reviewers video collection. I am Arturo Garduño Magaña, Open Ground Reviewers Program Manager and Trainer at Preview. And in this video, we will spend some time understanding the origin of some common biases as they may appear in the ground review process. This video is part of a collection of seven videos on the topic of addressing and mitigating bias in the ground review process. We invite you to check out the full video collection by visiting bat.ly forward slash open ground reviewers dash videos. It may be particularly helpful to watch the video Introduction to Bias in Grand Review, where we introduce the concept of bias and what motivates us to do this work. In that video, we saw that bias may significantly impact the fairness and integrity of the Grand Review process. For example, bias can lead to favoring or disfavoring an applicant because of their reputation, their race or ethnicity, their gender, or the reputation the institution the applicant works at. But where do those biases come from? Most biases, conscious or unconscious, are learned and stem from the experience we, as humans, have in the context of the society we live in. Biases that lead to the kind of systemic inequities we see here, which are often rooted into systemic beliefs that have been forged in our society throughout history. These are here referred to as systems of oppression, defined as discriminatory institutions, structures, norms, policies and practices embedded into our society, use it to oppress groups of people. Examples of systems of oppression include racism, colonialism, patriarchy, ableism, and many, many more isms that have towered in our society for centuries. How does oppression become systemic? Well, oppression and the bias that generate it first live at a personal level, in the way our values, beliefs, thoughts, prejudices, and ideas shape who we are with ourselves and who we are with others. Oppression and bias also manifest in our institutions, in the policy and practices kept alive in the organizations that reinforce that oppressive system, and all those policy, practices, beliefs, and prejudices tend to become norms at the core structural level of the entire societies. This is not surprising as it is the result of how we as individuals build who we are into what we do. All these levels are there as interconnected parts of a complex system, and each one of us has a role to play in upholding and dismantling these systems at these different levels. So the question for us here is, how can we, with our power and role within the grand review process, interrupt these systems? At a personal level, we can embark on a journey of self-reflection to surface our implicit biases, dig deeper into your explicit ones, and work on mitigating the impact these biases may have. At the interpersonal level, if we are calling as reviewers, we can make sure the evaluation we give to an applicant is fair, clear, constructive, and actionable. We can also commit to respectfully calling out oppression and its impact when we see it. If we're working for an institution or a funding organization and we have the power to change policies, norms, there is more we can do to ensure clear guidelines rooted in equity are implemented. Listed here are just some examples. All these actions are in our control and contribute to changing larger structural issues for the better. Next, we would like to offer an idea, a non-judgmental thought process of self-reflection to guide you through that first personal evaluation of your biases and how they may impact the way you contribute to the grand review process. The idea R2 method has four stages. Identify and evaluate the potential bias, add it to make it less covered, reverse it to think of deviations from this belief, and then rephrase the original statement, adjusting it in response to what you learned going through this reflection. By making the time to pause and think through our biases, we can usually find gaps in our knowledge that may need to research further, or simply find out that that initial belief doesn't make any sense, so we can update that belief. Let's take a moment to look at what this looks like in action with an example. Let's examine through the lens of the idr to framework with an example of a common bias in the grant review process. In this example, we are reviewing a grant proposal and after learning more about the applicant's academic career, we catch ourselves realizing that we hold the belief that because the applicant is at a senior stage of their career, they are likely to have a lot of domain expertise. Knowing this helps me to feel more confident in the quality of the proposed research approach. 
First, let's dig a bit deeper into why we, or someone else, may hold such belief. We can ask ourselves, why do the applicant's years of experience lead me to believe that the research approach in this proposal is of high quality? Well, one answer may be, I know this applicant is renowned in my field, so I think the project has good potential. They wouldn't let a bad project come from their lab. Therefore, I think this work is trustworthy. To further evaluate the issue, we can also ask ourselves, is this logical? Is there a rationale that supports the notion that experience equals trust in the quality of the work? Their years of experience and that they have gained the respect of the community may indicate that this is a good proposal. Then we can add the thought by asking, is this always true? Let's place always, warranty, or never into the statement. Let's try it. The applicant is at a late stage of their career and therefore must be very experienced and the research proposal should always be trustworthy. How does this sit with you? In most cases, making the statement so black and white will make us reflect. At this point, and if it makes sense for the example, it may be useful to reverse the original statement. In this case, can we think of a situation in which the years of experience will not influence the quality of this application? It's possible that the applicant may not have had time to supervise the work, or this may require an unfamiliar technique so they don't have experience with how best to perform the proposed research. Now we can rephrase the original statement taking into account the reflection we just made. We can say that although the applicant's experience and recognition in the field may correlate with the idea of a potentially good proposal and execution, it is not something I can take for granted. There are many factors that could influence the potential impact and success of a project. I should remember that the experience does not necessarily mean that the proposal is not questionable or that I can be quicker at evaluating the rigor of the application. Here are other examples you can run through the idea or two method on your own. You can find more about this framework and other example statements in the Open Ground Reviewers by Reflection Guide linked here. Please visit bit.ly forward slash OGR by Reflection Guide. Make sure to check other videos in this collection where we will cover some concrete strategies to mitigate bias in the ground review process. Check out bit dot ly forward slash open ground reviewers dash videos to access the full list of this video collection. This video was developed by the pre-review team for the Open and Equitable Model Funding Program in collaboration with the Open Research Funders Group and the Health Research Alliance. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please don't hesitate to email us at community at Thank you so much for your attention and see you in the next video.